salvation promised you have kept. Through Jesus' the living water, we pray. Amen. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins.
and the whole community of Israel left the wilderness of sin and moved from place to place. Eventually, they camped at Rehippim. But there was no water for, there for the people to drink. So once more, the people complained against Moses. Give us water to drink, they demanded. Quiet, Moses replied. Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord, the Lord Yahweh? But tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children, our livestock with thirst? Moses cried out to the Lord Yahweh. What should I do with these people? Are they ready to stone me? Lord Yahweh said to Moses, walk out in front of the people, take your staff, the one you used when you struck the, struck the water of the Nile and caused some of the elders of Israel to join you. I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock and the water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told and the water gushed out as the elders looked on. Moses named the place Messiah, which means test, and Meribah, which means arguing. Because the people of Israel argued Moses and tested the Lord Yahweh by saying, Is the Lord, is the Lord Yahweh here with us or not? Word be to God. Thanks be to God. Here are Psalters from uh, Psalms 95. We can draw up the noise to the Lord, the rock of our salvation. Come let us sing to the Lord. Let us sing to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. For the Lord is great is a great God. A great king of all gods. He holds in his hands the depth of the earth. <coughs> the sea belongs to him, for he made it. Come let us worship and bow down.
Let's stand for the reading of the Holy Ghost. Told us because we have heard him ourselves 
Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Thank you, baby. Let's begin with prayer, O oh Lord, let the words of my mouth, meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your holy sight, for truly you are indeed our strength, our rock, and our holy redeemer. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> uh, just a quick advertisement. Tonight we have our second installment of the life of Jesus. And uh, we'll be looking at his birth, his childhood, and then the beginning of his ministry. And that will be at 5 o'clock at First Presbyterian in Merrillville. As you know, it's a half a block north of US 30. And uh, we'll have a supper to begin with. And then um, as we we'll just you know, get something to eat, and we'll start with the lesson. So we'll be over relatively soon, although we don't have to worry about dark anymore, do we? <laughs> now that we've had the time change. <coughs> okay. Um, this is an interesting passage that deals with water, living water. Living water is water that flows. That's the idea. That's what they would have taken to mean. The God, uh, Old Testament lesson is uh, the very famous Mary by Amasa story, as it's called. The people of Israel are going out from Egypt. They're in the wilderness. They get thirsty. They, they want Moses to give them water. They're saying, why did the Lord bring us out here? Uh, they're complaining, uh, which is understandable. And uh, so then Moses uh, is instructed to uh, strike the rock. The water comes out of the rock. And it's flush, it's flowing out of the water, so it's living water in that sense. And I think that's why that Old Testament lesson is there. I'm not sure I would have used that, but you know, the lecture I put it together, that's what it, what it is, right? And so uh, they try to correlate the Old Testament with the Gospel lesson, and that's maybe the closest thing. There are other passages that talk about living water in the prophets and Psalms and so forth, but this is that idea, this living water, um, and it has another meaning, which is one of spirit. So the living water Jesus is talking about is related to the Spirit of God. Uh, not to himself, interesting enough. So when Jesus talks about being the good shepherd, I am the good shepherd, he identifies himself as that. I am the light of the world, right? But in this case, he gives living water. And so that's kind of why we think it might be related to the Holy Spirit. In fact, last week we saw that Jesus said, if you do not, uh, if you're not born of water and the Spirit, you cannot you know, be, become a part of the kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think it's direct. But I think there's a connection, because that's the way John works. And so now we have living water, which is the spirit. So now you got water and spirit. And when you drink of this water, it wells up into eternal life. The life of the spirit is really what he's getting at. And, and of course, we'll look at that and talk about that more. Let me tell you about my own experience. Um, in 1973, I rode my bicycle from San Diego, California to Jacksonville, Florida. That's 2,700 miles. Now, I know you don't believe that, and I got proof. Right? I got proof of it. I got a, I, I was on a big uh, page in the Hammond Times, this big, um, of my exploits. And, and so they asked me about different things. And, and I said, I learned to appreciate the simpler things of life, the simple things of life, uh, because we would have to sleep on a floor, a sleeping bag on a floor, many times in the church. So one time it was under the viaduct of I-10, because I-10, we were riding on it, but it wasn't open yet. So we, we rode to a spot, but there we go, we, underneath the viaduct. Uh, that kind of thing. So that if we ever had, one time somebody, we went to a place in Texas, and they, they, we could stay, we stayed at the Holiday Inn. I, I don't know how that happened, I don't remember exactly, it was a gift somehow. And uh, wow, that was really great, right? Something, something about it, it was like, wow, that's great. And then we would take hose showers because obviously in churches or out on the road you don't have them. So you could hook up a hose somewhere and just nice, nice cold water. Nice cold water, no hot water, cold water, which you know, of course wasn't too bad. And I was 17, so. Um, and, and so whatever. Um, so that was really nice. But the other thing that I learned was water quenches thirst. Now it doesn't seem really Surprising that somebody who was 17 would discover this, that that's really a kind of 
you just know that, right? But I don't like water, so I never drank water. When I was a, a baby or infant, toddler, my dad was always upset that I didn't drink water. And he would say to my mom, you've got to drink water. you got to make him drink water. I don't like water. I never have liked water. still don't like water. And, uh, but I discovered on this trip, because we rode out of uh, San Diego, go up to the mountains, then we had a 12-mile coast down onto the floor of the desert. By the way, I would lean, what we did is we would lean over our handlebars and because of the, you know, the blowers of wind resistance, and we'd go at least 70 miles an hour, oh. riding on a bike. And I had, unfortunately, a high-speed wobble. That means that after I got to a certain speed, my bike would start to shake. <laughs> like that. Well, you can't put your brakes on because it, 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 it gets too hot. I mean, you can just kind of do it slowly. You can't just go to immediate stop, right? Mainly because I go flying off or something, and the ribs would or you know, blow your tire or whatever. So I had to slow down. So it dawned on me, if I just sit up, that would slow me down, right? And so that happened. So I got it under control. And then it happened again, and I was like, oh, brother, what am I doing? You know, I could just see him sprawl out on the highway like that. But it didn't happen. Thank you, Lord. But we get down to the desert. Now we're riding in the desert. Now let me tell you something. Dry heat's no good. Anybody who tells you dry heat's good, they're lying. It's terrible because it's like an oven. If you stick your head in the oven, think, that's dry heat, folks. Do you like it? So that's what it's like in the desert. I'll never forget, we got to Houston. I was so glad for the humidity. I never been so glad for humidity in all my life. Because when you're on a bike and there's fire and you ride, the wind cools you down, right? Not in the desert. The pers perspiration evaporates immediately, and it's just hot. It's hot wind all the time. So it was just awful. Well, anyway, we get down there. So now i got to get something to drink. Well, my drink of preference was now water. So I got whatever was available. I think it was fruit punch or something. And I drank a whole bunch of it. And man, I did not feel good. That was not feeling good. Was, the sugar was terrible, right? My sugar is nice a little bit, but when you drink a lot, it's terrible. And not thirst quenching at all. So then the next time I tried water, and I thought, hey, look at this. What a, what a discovery. Water works. And it was absolutely, so from that point on, I drank water to quench the thirst. Now, when I wanted something else, and I would drink something else, but I mean, you know, that's just the way it worked. And I discovered that. So the simple thing about the value of water and how water can be so life-giving, right? How, how necessary it is and how thirst-quenching and all the rest is just glorious. Seems strange that it took me all those years to discover that. But it was very, very powerful. And so then I was, when, I, when I hear this story, I think of that. Because what we have is this kind of an interesting thing. So Jesus is making his way from Judea back to his base of operation. So he's from Nazareth, but his ministry place is Capernaum. They're not too far apart, but nevertheless, it's, up, it's in Galilee. So you've got Galilee, Samaria, Judea. So he's in Judea, he's got to go to Galilee, in the middle of Samaria. Samaria is a place you don't want to go to. There's places like that, right? I don't want to go, I'll avoid that, I'll go around it. And the Jews would do that. And there's a lot of reasons for it. It had to do with their history. And basically, Samaritans and Jews don't get along. It was mainly a problem for Jews. They thought the Samaritans had compromised, they had married the Assyrians, and they were not, they're essentially half-breeds, and for whatever reason, they're, they're not respected. And, and really importantly, they don't want to eat or drink with them. That's just a Jewish way of thinking, and we could get into it and talk about it, but just accept it for now, because that's the way they work. So they don't have anything to do with them. But the shortcut is through Samaria. You have to go way out of your way, or significantly out of your way, to go the other route. In fact, Jesus will go that route on the last week of his life. When he goes from Galilee to Jerusalem to, for the last week of his life, he does go that more, uh, the longer route. This time, he's cutting through Samaria. And so they get, they get to uh, a place, and he's tired. He needs food and drink. And so he sits down, and the disciples go off into town to get the food that they want, and he sits down by a well. Turns out that it's Jacob's well, according to the woman. There's nothing in the Old Testament that tells us about it. There's the mention of a well, but it's not designated that this is the place. It could have been, you know how that goes. Traditions accru 
referred to it, it could be accurate. But, and does this well have certain properties about it that people find it special? We're not really sure. What's unusual is this woman is coming out at noon to get the water. There was water in town, but she's coming out to get the water at noon. And probably it's because of her sordid past that she has led a life that is not respectable enough for whatever reason. As she, uh, she, when she talks to Jesus about it, she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right, you have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. So maybe she's coming out, there's speculation, but maybe she's coming out to avoid the people who would come out early in the morning. That's what they do. Uh, one thing I would remind you, that in the ancient world, you, you didn't live an anonymous life, ever. I mean, you could in Rome. Yeah, it's a really big place. There's a few and far between. You lived in a small village. Everybody knew your business. That's a fact. And knew it really well. So, you know, she's, she wants to avoid all the stuff. You can just imagine she comes out and goes, oh, that woman's coming out right out And that's very plausible. But she's at noon. And now Jesus is talking to her, which, number one, she knows he's a rabbi. We don't know how she knows he's a rabbi. Maybe he, looked, maybe he had some distinctive garb. You know, maybe rabbis wore something that indicated that they were rabbis. But anyway, she says, she has a rabbi, he says, can you give me a drink? And he's, she's like, what? Almost like she, it would be almost like she couldn't hear him. He said something to me. Are you talking to me? Right? It could be like that. And so now, uh, she says, can you give me, and she says, can you give me something to drink? And she says, are you really asking me for a drink? Not like, not like she's put off by it. She's totally surprised. She's astonished that he's talking to her because he's a Jew. He's a rabbi. And you don't talk to women, especially a woman like her. Now, don't forget, even if, well, we're told that Jesus understood that, but even if she didn't, she knew it. And so, you know how that is. So she understands that he, she's thinking he's seeing everything about her. And so she goes like, I don't know why he's talking to me. And the end result is, he says, well, actually, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you would have said, please give me living water. She goes, wow. And then she jumps ahead. Remember when I told you living water is water that blows? She's going, where's this living water? I don't see any, I don't see any living water right now. I see a well, but I don't see any living water. Did you know somewhere where there's living water? That would be better, the purer. I remember when I was uh, on a youth field trip, uh, a youth trip uh, in high school, we went to the Smoky Mountains, and they had a rushing river, right? And they said, you can drink right from the river. Now, don't forget, I'm in high school. I live here. There's not a river anywhere near her that I would put a cup in and drink water from. There's not a river here that I would go into. I, you know, see the lake, there was always stories that people would go into the water and come out green, you know, that when I was in high school. So now, you're telling me I can take a cup and drink it from a And then the guy goes, well, somebody was there, he goes, hey, you know what, this is even better than distilled water, because it doesn't have as many ions. I'll never forget that. Oh, really? Well, I don't want any water, it's got a bunch of ions in it. I had no idea what he was talking about, right? But it was really funny. But it was really amazing, the water was fresh and good, you could just drink it. That's the kind of thing she's thinking. This is living water. It's not stagnant water from a pool. It's not anything like that. It's living water. She can drink it. So, you know what? Tell me where that is. And actually, maybe then I would, I would never get thirsty again. And I would have to come here and draw the water. Now, who knows what she meant by that? She's just running with it, right? And Jesus says, well, actually, the water I can give is water that can well up within you comes gushing forth, just like that living water, into eternal life. And of course, he's talking about the Spirit. And he makes this plain. He goes, look, at you, Jew, or you Samaritans worship God on this Mount, Mount Gerizim. There had been a temple up there, but the Jews destroyed it. Uh, long story, but nevertheless, that's where that mountain was. They didn't recognize Jerusalem. Now, that has to go back in their history, but they didn't recognize Jerusalem in the temple. And he said, we Jews worship God in Jerusalem, the temple. But a time is coming, and is now here, when the true worshipers of God will worship God in spirit, drunk from the living water, spirit again, and 
in truth. For that's what God seeks, those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Salvation comes from the Jews. In other words, the, the, the knowledge of God that has been revealed comes, and the one who is of God, from God, is God, comes from the Jews. But it's going to be the time now when all of that will be open to all. Now what's interesting here is, Jesus is taught in John 3 to Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, a very a leader of the Jews. He, he knows all this stuff. And he speaks to him and says, you've got to be born of water and the Spirit. Now he comes to a Samaritan woman who's on the extreme, other extreme, right? She doesn't have any knowledge of God because, not any, but she, she's well behind, if you would, in terms of what their understanding is. And he says to her, you've got to drink of the living water that will well spring up with you, gush into, you, into eternal life. Jesus, now this is a different so this is John. In the Gospel of Luke and in Acts, they're commissioned, the disciples are commissioned to go out into the world, and he says, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. So Jesus had just been a witness in Judea to Nicodemus, or to, um, yeah, to Nicodemus. Now he is a witness in Samaria to the woman at the well, and eventually to the ends of the earth. It's all living water. He says, that's what you need. You need living water. Because that's the water that satisfies. That's the water that will quench your thirst. Now, obviously, he's giving a metaphor here. So, in, in light of the fact that um, I wore my cup scarf in here by accident, well, kind of. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I don't know if you've heard me talk about this. Part of it is if you're not a fan, you don't quite get it. Uh, but, um, you know, when the Cubs won in 2016, that's the first time they had won in 108 years. 108 years. 108 years. That was the longest drought in sports history. I mean, of all sports. Um, so it was, I, I, it was just one of the greatest days of my life when they won. I remember I was walking on the treadmill with the overhead light on because I believed that was a good luck charm. It's totally irrational, but that's what it means to be a fan. So I'm walking, and then the ground ball to third, uh, Chris Bryant throws it over to Anthony Rizzo in a couple of the World Series, and I was like, Amy had gone to bed by this point because it was late. And I was like, Cubs won the World Series. I, I didn't even know what to do. I was so, I, I was speechless. Can you believe that? I was speechless. <laughs> I was just, it was like unbelievable. I woke up in the morning, there's the headlines, Cubs won the World Series, and I was just like, oh, this is so great. Well, you know, I, I really enjoyed that. I've been thirsting for that for a long time. That part of it was, that what made it so special was all this, is, just think if you were a Yankees fan, they won all, the, they won 25, 26, 20 world championships and a whole bunch of pennants. It's like, oh, big deal. We won again. Well, we don't have that. So we're like, oh, this is so great. And so then immediately after that, now the next year and the year after, they didn't win. And they had good seasons. But it was like, they didn't win the World Series. Like, good. Like, what are you talking about? They won the World Series in 2016. That's good enough for me in my life now. They don't have to win anymore. They won. That's good enough. That's what we're talking about, the satisfaction that Jesus gives. It's a satisfaction that says, it's happened, it's good, and no more is needed. I don't really always like to compare to sports, but that's the closest analogy I have. Except for this, it happened to me last night. I saw my granddaughter. So, she's two years old. She hasn't really warmed up to me, but last night she did. And uh, I, I had dropped Amy off at the airport because she's going to get her grandson next week. And um, they're going to be living here, so it's all great. But so I just popped up to see her at dinner with them. And she was absolutely just one of those moods, you know. And uh, so she's playing with me, and she pretends she's uh, squirting me with water. And I make 
well, I created a monster because, you know, once they start, they don't stop. They keep doing it. And they kept, kept all like this and laughing every time. And then I pretended I was eating her arm and she'd laugh. And so then she gave me a kiss and a hug. And she called me Far Far, which is, you know, grandfather and sweet. Okay, it was done, right? That's it. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. There's nothing better I could do in my life at any time than that. You all know, you have similar experiences. Either grandchildren or friends or whatever. I didn't have it with my dumb dog. She's with me. I'm holding her. Like, okay, I'm good. Nothing else is needed. And that's true. That's the satisfaction you get from being in the moment and appreciating that love, whatever it might be, and you go, oh, I'm not thirsty anymore. I don't need anything else. I don't need more money. You know, what, uh, my favorite story about that is John D. Rockefeller Sr. is the richest man in the world, in world history, by a, by a lot, because if you translate the dollars. At one time, uh, he, his company refined 90% of all the oil world. I said that right. 90% of all the oil in the world came from Standard Oil. So he's the richest man. The funny thing is, you know, they decided he had too much money. He was too powerful, so they were going to break up his corporations, right? So they broke up the oil companies into, you know, what became Exxon and Standard Oil California and Standard Oil of Ohio. He got more money after they broke him up. He was much wealthier after they decided they were going to show him. And I thought that was kind of, that's just funny. So anyway, they said to him, how much more money do you need? Now, he had more money than he could ever spend, than his children could ever spend. And they're still, you know, still gone. He said, just a little bit more. <laughs> right. so, so that's the you, you, you never get You never get enough. Think about it. You never get enough. When you get satisfied, you have all that you need in that moment. That's what I'm talking about, that love. That's what I was trying to say, that love, or some event, or some experience, you go, that's it. That's satisfying. And of course, that's only just a reflection. Now with the love of God, when we experience it, it's forever. Think of this, why are we going to be satisfied in heaven? Because we are going to be in the presence of God. Not, no barrier. We're going to be in the presence of God. We're going to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. If you've heard of that from the Westminster Catechism. Forever, and it will never get tired or boring or the same because it's it, you just are going to revel in that love, in that grace, in that mercy, in that joy of being in the presence of the eternal one. we drink, we get that when we drink of the living water. It is utterly satisfying and transforming. And we experience the eternal life, that life which is to come right now. We experience God and His love right now. And that's why it's satisfying. And so if we understood that, we'd say, oh Lord, above everything, give me that water. That's the water I need. And that's the water, the water that sustains my life. The living water. Bless me. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us so richly. Thank you, Lord, that you have given to us just the incredible, satisfying blessings of your grace in this living water. So we have everything we need and we never need to thirst again. Bless us and help us to be faithful and to receive that which you have for us in Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, let's stand together and affirm our faith through the recitation of the nine seed. Let us confess the faith of one holy Catholic that is universal and apostolic. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that he has seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day 
He ascends into heaven and is seated at the right hand. He will come again to give glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead. Thank you. May be seated. Uh, are there any uh, prayer requests that need to be made? Any prayer requests? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, for a long time. Uh, had an excellent gunshot that moved to this hand and leg. And what's his name? Rolando. Rolando. Pray for Rolando and, and uh, gunshot wound? Yes. Uh, my niece, uh, Lisa, her pants are returned and she has to undergo chemo again. Okay, for, pray for Lisa uh, and cancer treatments. Yes? Uh, my brother Ryan is going to need surgery at the end of March um, for some nerve stuff going on in his head, I guess. The side of his head and his jaw and all that. So he's going to have surgery at the end of the month. Uh, but his father-in-law um, had 99% blockage in his heart. <clears throat> had to have emergency surgery, so pray for him. Too. And his name is? Neil Slater. Neil and Ryan. 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 Pray for Ryan. Um, with uh, surgery. Uh -huh. Also, continue prayer for my friend Doug Crowley. He has leg amputated. Okay, for Doug? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, let's continue. Then. Let us have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus as we pray for the world he came to save, saying, Have mercy, O God. <laughs> and we pray for the uh, Holy Catholic there's Universal Church. Uh, wherever the church is found, Lord, let us be an oasis in the desert, a spring of living water for all who thirst, an abundant feast for all who hunger. Of course, we do this all through Christ. Have mercy, O God. <laughs> and we do pray for our world, the world in which we live, which is uh, so horrible in many ways in the way that it uh, conducts its business. By your everlasting covenant, embrace all the nations of this earth with your steadfast, saving love. Have mercy, O God. Yeah. And we pray for this community, the communities in which we live. Save those who are perishing. Let new life flourish among us and help us to bear good fruit. Have mercy, O God. Yeah. And we pray for our loved ones. Show your great faithfulness to those who are sick or suffering. Strengthen them and make them whole. Have mercy, O God. Yeah. And we pray for Rolando and uh, dealing with the gunshot wound. We pray for uh, Jerry's friend who, uh, Doug, I think, who had uh, amputation. We pray to watch over them and bless them and help them. We pray for Lisa, who's dealing with the recurrence of cancer. We pray that you uh, help her. She goes through her treatments for those who treat her. We pray for uh, Ryan as he faces surgery to deal with his nerve problem. And we also pray for Neil uh, and as he recovers from surgery from the blockage in his heart. Thank you, Lord, that we can lift up to you these our prayers of concern. We pray for all those who are suffering today and are hurting, our loved ones, our friends. Uh, we pray for traveling mercies for Amy and Carolyn and Braxton and Gideon as they move back up here this next week. We pray for um, all the concerns we have uh, that are left unexpressed, but nevertheless are very important to us. And we know that you know them because you know everything about us. You know our standing up and our sitting down, our going forth and coming in. Just uh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we pray for those who are on our prayer list continually. Watch over them and bless them. We pray for this church. Help us to be faithful in all things. Concluding, as we pour out our hearts in prayer, O oh God, lead us to pour out our lives in service to you, ever seeking your will, ever following your way, all in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together with great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. You made an everlasting covenant with us, through, uh, though we forsook.
took your way. Still, you call the thirsty to come to the waters. You invite the poor and the hungry to come and eat. Therefore, we praise you. Join the song of the universal church in the heavenly choir. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus calls us to repent so that we might not perish. Like a gardener, Jesus tends to us with loving care, waiting patiently for our lives to bear the fruit of his grace. We give you thanks to the Lord Jesus on the night before he died took bread. And after giving thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take heed. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. For every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus until it comes. Therefore, let us proclaim the great mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon this bread and this cup. Make us one in the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. No Lord, provide us with spiritual food and drink in the wilderness, as you have done for our brothers and sisters who passed through the sea. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we bless you, our Father, the God of glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us to pray, so we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. The body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Take and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you.
his peace. Try me with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.